All right, so um, this is not a primary content lecture for um, a particular exam. This is really, though, for the um, second exam, sort of an overview would, would kind of come at the beginning before really all the lecture content um, that would be going into the second exam. Uh, this would kind of be the introductory lecture, the explanation of what it is we're actually going to cover um, in the next block of material. And uh, right now I'm just going to try to put a few terms out there um, that should come up then later on as well. But uh, the idea is really just to give you the overview. So as you go through individual lectures, um, you kind of know where they fit in uh, and why they're there. Uh, and then what is the whole entire scope of the material? So this is just really the, uh, the overview of material for the uh, our, what we have as our second exam. Um, and it really can, is related to uh, metabolism, uh, energy, and then cell division or, or cell growth uh, in bacteria. So the first thing I'm going to talk about are some uh, some terms um, that will come up. The bacteria have a variety of different uh, metabolic pathways that they can use. And the idea here is that they need to, um, again, you can't, they don't produce energy. There's really no such thing. What they're doing is the energetics part of it is energy conversion. So that's really what a lot, uh, what, what's going on in a lot of metabolism. Uh, and we really have two major kinds of metabolism going on. We have catabolism and anabolism. All right. In catabolism, we break molecules down in order to uh, release energy. And then uh, in anabolism, these processes require energy. And there we're, we're going to build, build structures, build molecules. So build things that didn't exist in the cell before, but those are processes are going to require energy. So the idea is we go through um, how do organisms acquire energy? How do they then convert that into a usable form, which is usually going to be should know this, uh, right, is going to be primarily ATP. So ATP is going to be the molecule that cells are mostly going to use for, you know, active transport and the building of larger molecules, the building of the cell wall, um, motion, if the flagella for moving, all ATP is going to be used for all these different things. And so where's that energy come from? So we have phototrophs and chemotrophs. We could break them down to the, those categories. Phototrophs are going to get their uh, directly their energy from light, All right? And the chemotrophs are going to get energy from oxidation events, which hopefully you know a little bit about, uh, which is the removal of electrons from molecules that, that can then be used to make other molecules. The what we're used to talking about the the uh, autotrophs they're actually going to make their own organic molecules. And the heterotrophs require organic molecules. So phototrophs are getting energy directly from light, from photons, photonic light. Um, and then uh, if you're an autotroph, um, you're not getting your energy um, directly from organic molecules. Um, you, but you have, so you have to make those molecules. Um, and so uh, there, these are organisms that can also um, break down or, or use in oxidation events uh, inorganic molecules are, as well. Um, so like carbon dioxide and water, um, and then there's uh, oxidation events that can be done um, with the chemo um, autotrophs um, where they can use like iron, uh, magnesium, sulfur um, during, uh, during the oxidation reactions. So things that are, are inorganic. So there's all these other varieties of things that they can do. There's a, there's a great diversity uh, of um, strategies in order for bacteria to acquire energy from the environment. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of subcategories, right? Whether, whether they're, where they're getting their um, primary energy from and then where they're getting their carbon source from. So is their carbon source coming from 
uh, carbon dioxide or is there carbon source coming from uh, organic molecules? Okay, so then the, the heterotroph is going to get them from organic molecules. The auto, autotrophs are going to get them from carbon dioxide, okay, so from, from inorganic forms. And that's the same for whether they're photo or chemo autotrophs. So that's kind of just the, the broader overview. And then there's all kinds of variety uh, of unique things that happen uh, so that allow bacteria to live in extreme environments like hydrothermal vents, um, where they're using sulfur um, as a final electron acceptor uh, and the iron and, and a variety of other, other things. But what we're going to focus on really in our class is going to be the, just the core pathways, things that are common, common for uh, mostly all the bacteria uh, and pretty much even for our cells you know, as well. All right, and so those core pathways in metabolism uh, are often going to involve glucose. And that glucose could be obtained from the environment or it could be formed by the organism um, in an autotrophic uh, fashion. All right, but so however it gets there, that, that's sort of separate. The, all these organisms are then going to have these other core pathways in common. Right, whether they're photo or chemo or auto or heterotrophs. Right? So there's something core that is unifying all of them, and including even our cells and plant cells and all these other organisms. And that's really what we're focused on. You should know this uh, material, especially now at the, the end of this course. And what we're going to then go into are some then later uh, side pathways and things um, that are variations that, that bacteria do, uh, variations that involve anaerobic respiration where um, there is no oxygen. So what else can they do uh, to produce um, acids and alcohols and, and other products as well? And then we kind of get into the whole main point of that um, for us here looking at um, not just the production of lipids or the production of DNA and RNA or the production of proteins, but for a purpose. And what purpose is that? Uh, well, what we're going to be focused on is the, the purpose is going to be for cell growth or cell division. So the cells can divide into two new cells. Um, they're going to require more membranes. They're going to require more cell wall. They're going to require more enzymes. They're going to require more of everything, which means they're going to require energy to build all those things. And that's kind of how this really connects. And so I'm going to draw a little picture kind of showing you uh, how some of the things connect just with some major terms. It's not highly detailed or anything. Later at the end of this material, uh, as you go through it, though, there will be um, then a exam review of the last material where I would go into some more details on some of the specific topics. But this is just kind of a broad, broader introduction. So glucose uh, usually becomes a phosphorylated. Uh, and so glucose is a six carbon sugar. So we call those hexose phosphates. It can be broken down into a pentose phosphate. So that's five carbon. And that could be used to make the sugars uh, of the nucleotides. The hexose phosphates are also then broken down into triose triose phosphates so that's three right uh, and that's like our most common molecule is, is g3p so that's something you should know glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate um, because the g3p molecule is one of the products of photosynthesis it's going to make g3p really the uh, um, light reactions uh, of actually the light independent reactions their product the calvin cycle is g3p specifically um, and this is what's produced through the breakdown of uh, glucose it's sort of an intermediate there and then it can be used to branch off i'm going to just check make sure i get all these other things so like for example um wrong way so three carbon can make things like glycerol right and glycerol is used to make fatty acids all right so our lipids you know, can come out of this. So we could get nucleotides really coming out of these core structures. We get the lipids, you know, coming out of these structures. Um, they, um, some of these can go into all their alternative pathways to make certain amino acids can come out of these pathways. Um, and those amino acids, certain amino acids, um, like glycine, for example, can be used to make some of our um, purines and pyrimidines, the um, 
nitrogenous basis uh, of the DNA and RNA. So the other part of the nucleotides, the nucleotide is going to have a phosphate, a sugar, um, and then the nitrogenous base. So the nitrogenous base is to come from somewhere. So that kind of will connect. Um, so the triose phosphates then kind of continuing along, say, our core pathway, though. So these are kind of like side, you know, branching pathways. Uh, we have phosphoenopyruvate, and then eventually we get to pyruvate. So we're going to go through glycolysis and then pyruvate oxidation specifically, which would then lead to uh, the citric acid cycle. So that would form acetyl-CoA, and that's with oxygen. Uh, and then that goes to citric acid cycle. Now without oxygen, without oxygen, uh, we're going to have fermentation reactions. And those fermentation reactions will have uh, unique uh, acid and alcohol products. And that's what we're going to focus on, uh, sort of the, the major ones. But there are, I'll give you a list of just which you won't have to know, but just so you can see the diversity of them, of all the different sorts of products that can come from fermentation. And they, they have a number of then industrial uses um, so that we can then use bacteria in these giant bioreactors to actually make all kinds of molecules for us. Um, and then we harvest harvest that, that material, right? And so fermentation could do that with for us with, say, um, making alcohols and all kinds of uh, alcoholic drinks or uh, producing carbon dioxide, um, rising you know bread and things like that uh, doing fermentation within uh, milk and cheeses making yogurts and all these sorts of things um, all because of fermentation products so there's a whole application aspect of this uh, fermentation which again we're going to get into a little bit uh, of the details of that but there's a whole whole uh, other part of material we're not going to really go into um, and so uh, the acetyl-CoA can also be used to make uh, then the uh, fatty acids as well. So kind of like the long carbon chains, the nonpolar carbon chains can come from that. So we get the glycerol, right, and three fatty acids to make um, our triglycerides. And so we're going to getting, you know, part of it from here, part of it from there. And so there's all kinds of other branching pathways where all these things can then come back together again. But the main thing to take away from it is what we're going to focus on the class, the lectures that will follow, will be on uh, enzymes first. How do enzymes work? Um, what do enzymes do to help chemical reactions? Because this is all about chemical reactions. So you need to know about the enzymes first. Then we're going to focus on some chemical reactions, and that's going to be specifically these core ones. Glucose through uh, glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, citric acid cycle. Uh, all these are going to have products. One of the biggest emphasis molecules of this is going to be the product of NADH. So NADH is, and I'm going to put a big, these are supposed to be stars um, to emphasize, uh, this is important. One of the main products of all those processes, the way the cell is going to harness energy or convert energy is in electrons. So it's going to be electrons carried by NADH. Now fermentation something you need to keep in mind, one of the purposes, the major purpose of fermentation, right, is not to make acids or alcohols or any of these other products. We can use it for that, for our benefit. But for the cell, the purpose of fermentation is to recycle NADH molecules into NAD plus molecules so that they can be cycle back into NADH molecules and that these processes can occur without oxygen. So that's something, again, we'll go into the details later, but fermentation, the purpose of it is really related again back to this molecule, the NADH. So that's going to carry things on into uh, electron transport chain. And one of the differences is when we study this in eukaryotic cells, we talk about the mitochondria now, but bacteria don't have mitochondria. All right, so where does this take place? So we're really going to be talking about the, the location as well as the process. The process is pretty much the same as it is in mitochondria. Uh, it's just the location is different. These proteins that are the pumps in the electron transport chain, the ones that are transporting the electrons, they're in the cell membrane. And then they're pushing things from the cytoplasm, they're pushing protons from the cytoplasm uh, to the periplasm. 
And then remember, outside the periplasm, we still have the cell wall. All right, so the periplasm can be a space, like the intermembrane space of a mitochondria. Again, we go into that separately in a, another lecture, but that's the idea here. And, and that we can then use the energy from the pumping here, essentially to make ATP. So bacteria are gonna make ATP pretty much the same way your cells make ATP. Um, and regardless of whether they're doing things aerobically or anaerobically, or they're getting things from um, directly from organic uh, molecules or inorganic sources, with whether they're using different things as a final electron acceptor, um, or if oxygen's the final electron acceptor, um, doesn't matter. A lot of these things are still going to be united, you know, and the same. Finally, um, we're going to then get into the application of this, which is to um, allow a cell, you know, to divide. <laughs> into two new cells, our binary fission, that's what we call it. And so we're gonna to have to have two major things happening uh, for binary fission to occur. We're gonna to have to have genome replication and then division of the genome. So think mitosis but not mitosis. So the, the concept of mitosis where the chromosomes are kind of pulled apart, but we don't have that here. We have one circular, right? Remember a circular chromosome. That's what we had in the original cell. And then that's gonna to have to be divided into, you know, two new cells. We have to double the DNA and then separate it. So we have to pull the new chromosome into another cell. So that has to be coordinated. So we're gonna look at the proteins and all involved in that process, how it's anchored to the membrane, how they guide then the, the pulling apart. But then we're gonna to have to have the cell actually divide. It's got to be split into two pieces. So what we're also going to uh, require is to split the membrane, which isn't that hard, but we also have to split the cell wall, which is a little more difficult. Um, and a little more challenging and potentially dangerous to the cell if it doesn't control the process properly and it could damage the cell and, and, and die. Um, so, and then we have to build new cell membranes. So we have to go and cell walls. So you have to go back to the study of what is the cell wall, what are the components of the cell wall. We're gonna get into the, the M enzymes uh, and other proteins that are involved in the reconstruction and additional construction of cell wall material. So we're gonna kind of add to that. And then we'll look at some things like uh, patterns of growth and control. So how do cells then control and regulate that? How can they sense um, how dense uh, they are? Uh, so by essentially communicating uh, among themselves to regulate whether they should continue to divide or stop you know, dividing. Um, and other sorts of things that affect growth. So everything from environment, the temperature of the environment, the pH of the environment, those sorts of things. Uh, and also to things like antibiotics and disinfectants. What did they do specifically? So we'll introduce a little bit of information on like a mechanism of action where an antibiotic actually binds to the specific proteins that are involved in the cell wall construction, uh, like transpeptidase, um, which will then link, make the peptide bridges but uh, between the NAM and NAG, and then by disrupting that, disrupting the cell wall, causing the cell to die, right, and burst. Others can, you know, bind to the DNA or bind to proteins that bind to the DNA. They could stop the replication process or they can stop other sorts of things. So we'll get a little bit into the control uh, part of it as well, then at the end. And again, that kind of relate, will relate back to all the way to the beginning where we're going to start off with enzymes. You know, what are how do enzymes work and what are the things, inhibitors and activators that control and regulate enzymes? You'll come back to that really at the very, very end when we talk about how antibiotics then affect those proteins and enzymes that are involved in constructing the cell wall. All right, so that's just kind of just a very broad, generic kind of overview. There's a few little details and things in here, but really there's a whole bunch of lectures I have now on um, uh, on enzymes, enzyme kinetics, activation energy, how enzymes work, and then the basics of glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, oxidation, citric acid cycle, electron transport, ATP, then we go into fermentation and variations and a couple side pathways, um, and then we get into the cell division. So that's kind of the summary. That's everything that you should be covering from, you know, from now, hopefully you've, even, you've already started some of this, um, to, to when we have the second exam.